Uh, I'd like you to take a look at Luke chapter 9, that, or 11 rather, that Charles read to you, and you'll see what this is about. We are continuing in our study of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and we're looking here this morning at what is called the mission. What is the uh, objective of the body of Christ between the cross and the crown? I heard a D-Day veteran once talk about that at D-Day when he left from England across the channel and he headed to Normandy, there on the southern tip of France. And he said he, he knew it was big, but it, until he looked out across the sky and saw these planes that were almost wing to wing. And he looked down and in the, in the gloom he saw the, these ships and just a, the greatest landed invasion of all time. And he realized that he was part of something that was beyond the scope of anything that had ever been before that this was the greatest landed invasion against the greatest evil that had ever been concocted. This was a world at war. This was the greatest cause in the deliverance of Western Europe and China and what... Uh, was about to become England and the U.S. from Nazism. And so he realized that no matter how hard this was, he said, I was at the place that I should have been. No matter what happened to me, that I was at the place I should have been, that I was on the cutting edge of human history. Well, the mission of the church is just like that, except it's larger in scope. And it is more sinister in what it goes against. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authority, world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. That we know what is behind the looking glass, that it's not just a Hitler or a Mussolini that it is the demonic that is behind this. And we know that the, the conclusions, you don't get to have a fourth quarter and go home. You don't get to have a ninth inning. You don't get to have a, an armistice. That it is heaven or it is hell on the eternal souls of man. It is not just politics and government that is at risk. It is the soul of man in the image of God. It is an even greater mission than was World War II. So what is our mission? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. And suffer me to stay close to my notes here at the beginning to make sure I don't say the wrong thing. But I, when I give you the mission of the church, I warn you that it is different than anything anywhere in the world in that it's enchanted. It is otherworldly that our mission involves the supernatural, the invisible forces of wickedness, Paul called them, that it is hidden. It is something that is so enormous and sinister that man with his pupils cannot take it in as to the dimension of it. You have to be educated unto it. Uh, the mission of the church goes through the wardrobe, as in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. You dig? There's something behind it. It's not just a physical thing. To, earn, to learn the, the mission of the church, you go behind the wardrobe into a world that you had never seen. It is down the rabbit hole. What am I talking about? Alice in Wonderland. It's something bigger than you and I. That the problem with modern man, to preface this, the problem with modern scientific man, modern scientific rational 
skeptical of everything except what he can empirically see and quantify and put in a test tube. That is modern man. Modern man lives in a closed universe. We have been educated and punished if we don't believe that, that there's nothing outside what we can see, that the universe is matter, it is natural, it is atoms, and that is all. That is a closed system. The Bible treats it as an open system. There is something beyond the looking glass, that you just see you, there's something beyond you. It begins in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God, he was already there, and he created, came from somewhere, and man is in the very image of God. And so the problem with modern man is that he is closed since about the 1850s. And he leaves no possibility for what he cannot see. He has no answers that will be invisible impetus to things that are happening. He has no answers for what he instinctively feels and answers for what he instinctively knows. He knows in his heart there is right and wrong. He knows that there's someone that he accounts to. He knows that there is an absolute standard for right, wrong, and the dignity of man above all the rest of nature or even the animal realm. He knows it. He feels it. He is, he is instinctive to that. Uh, so even if he claims that everything came from a big bang and from a mutational system of ev evolutionary system and man is nothing but harm, animal and morals, mind and all of those things are just biochemically created, he'll hold that until somebody shoots the wrong guy in Dallas. Amen? And I don't care how atheistic he is, he will start calling for divine absolute justice. And so the modern man idea is purely anaerobic. It has to exist outside of oxygen. Once you let it outside of the vacuum of the classroom and the debate schedule, it goes up in smoke. And all of a sudden, as soon as somebody wants to take your daughter out, then you're, initially, you're immediately a Calvinist. <laughs> Everybody's a Calvinist as soon as you get hurt. So man lives in a world where there is no magic. Like C.S. Lewis said, it's always winter and it's never Christmas. We have been schooled to believe in a natural closed world that originated from an accident, that it came from nothing, its order is purely, its majesty is purely time, chance, mutation. That is all. It is all interpreted by sentia, by knowledge of what you can see knowledge that man is the arbiter of, the discoverer of, and thus things that are seemingly outside what you can touch, mind, emotion, heart, conscience, will, morals, heroism, dignity. They are all biochemically corralled and defined, and they are defined in us to us in answers that do not make sense that the effect is greater than the cause. And they are answers that we will not live with. We can listen to an atheistic idea and a naturalistic idea, and it's all well and good if you're trying to hustle a gar girl in a bar. Write that down. It's a marvelous system if you want no one to hold you account for that moment as to what you're doing. But as soon as you get married and have kids and have neighbors and have nations next door to you, now you need a God. It was Voltaire who said, if there is no God, then we need invent one. And so man will not live with the looking glass. You know what I mean by the looking glass? It's a philosophic term. It means that man will not live in a universe that all he can see is him. That there must be not something behind it, 
there must be someone because man is an instinctive orphan. He is Luke Skywalker. He is looking somewhere for his father. He is, she is Princess Leah. She is Debbie Reynolds' daughter. Are you with me? And she is a Skywalker. And she will find a face out there. She will find somewhere that it says, in the beginning, God, this person made me. And if we find answers that are unlike that, that it will appear to us horror. It's why modern man is unwilling to believe in God, but he is willing to believe in sci-fi and science fiction. It's interesting, but modern man is the inventor of science fiction. And science fiction is putting a face behind the looking glass. Man won't live as an atheist. He won't have God because he doesn't want to be held into account. But he will have UFOs. As long as they're Baptists. <laughs> they got to be moral UFOs. He will have demons. Am I right? Man will have demons. He'll have angels. He will have horror motifs. He would rather have an alien and a demon and a predator and Freddy Krueger and Chucky before he will have nothing but atoms, A-T-O-M-S, that are dust in the wind of a black cosmos. He will not live that way. It is his greatest horror is that there is nothing out there. And so when you look at the church's mission, you have to start with man's origin and then you go to man's dilemma, his fall. Because the mission is bringing the two back. You first look at the original creation, a unity and diversity, a universe that is made from nothing but the fiat command of God. By his world words were the worlds made of a supreme intelligence, benevolent, beautiful, ordered with infinite wonder and majesty and morality and beauty of character. Amen? Now I don't have to crucify my intellect and say that what is here, the effect is greater than the cause. I don't have to now be a living idiot. I can now have a substantial reason for what I see and what I feel and what I believe and what I long for. And that man was the crown jewel. That he is the signature from God. Man is the image bearer. He is the vice regent that God put here to eat from God's hand, to be immortal, to subdue, cultivate, gain dominion, and fill the earth as God's kingdom. That we are not nothings, as John Paul Sartre said, bubbles of nothingness on sea of, bubbles of emptiness on seas of nothingness. No, that we are Adam, the son of God, that begat children, that were children of God by divine creation. And you know what happened, that there was a test, an originator of evil, that sin has an origin, that it's not pantheistic, it is not dualistic, that sin has an origin that is truly evil. It came through a rogue angel, a previous creation to serve man by God, a servant that had gone mad, the original broken arrow, the adversary, Satan. Interesting, he's called Satan against God, the adversary, and then he's called the devil, the diabolos, the accuser. To God, he is an adversary, and to man, he is an accuser. He challenges God, and he destroys humans. 
And anything that God makes, whether it's man, his body, his home, his, his family, his morality, his government, nature, Satan will have an answer that annihilates it. He is brilliant, corrupt, but brilliant in what he does. He leaves nothing in his ambitions but what glorifies him, and that is a black hole. And through that, we saw sin, we saw the curse, we saw man now cut loose from the tether, and he is now, he has no standard for existence for himself, and he wanders far and far from the mere instinct that holds him tethered, farther and farther, until finally man becomes mad. He becomes crazy. It was Rousseau who said that you can take any creature of nature and you can study it because it never changes. A cheetah is hardwired to be a cheetah. A leopard is hardwired to be a leopard. You don't study the advancement and the fall and reformation of the animal kingdom because it's hardwired. It does what it must. Man is in the image of God. He has choices. And thus with man you study chaotic renaissance, dark ages, reforms, and kingdoms, that man is the one creature that goes mad when he gets claustrophobic and he loses sight of who is there. That man is the, uh, the violent creature, that when any other creature sticks his hand in his cage, that man will take it off. He eats for fun not because he's hungry. He will kill for fun, not because he's hungry. And he becomes a devouring thing in a nature that is now hostile, that is deadly, that is adversarial, in an animal realm that will consume him. He is the wanderer. He is east of Eden. That Satan hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And his history becomes a horror story. It becomes man who invents his gods and invents his religions, these stairways to nowhere, and creates these kings and political systems and economies that become quicksand and tar pits and that are studied in not continuative glory, but they are archaeological digs of death, and you have names of Genghis Khan and Attila and barbarians and vandals that ring up in those and Nazis and commies and all the rest. You have this chamber of horrors of man unlike any other creature. You have this wax museum of horror of no other creature. He manufactures his own law. He isn't willing just to be existential and everybody do what's right in his own eyes, he will invent and try to invent law coming from nature or his own mind or the spirit of the zeitgeist or the something like that. He will try to do some illusory idea to maintain the bars to protect himself and corral people out. And like Frankenstein, he will rebuild man from dead parts hoping that lightning will fall and nature somehow will vivify this thing that I have made and enliven this monster, but it leaves him more violent than the creatures that he rules. If you're new to Denton Bible, we welcome you today and just <laughs> pray you'd have a blessed Sunday. Am I right so far? I'm sorry, but I'm right. That sounded bad. I'm correct. This is what, it, this is what happened to us. And into this darkness, there is one little light that flickers. It's the first sentence that God spoke after the sin of man. I will put hatred between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed, natural man, and hers. And he will bruise your head, and you will wound his heel. I'm going to send a man someday that will conquer sin, Satan, and death, and he will do it by giving his life for mankind to transfer your children, Satan, out of your kingdom into the very kingdom of God. I'm going to give a new Adam, 
and he will reconquer the earth. A new Normandy. And he will restore man to the realm of God. And once again, man will become sane because he will know God. That's your end of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he came with this designated meticulousness. Born of Adam, born of Seth, born of Noah. After Noah, it said he would come of Shem. Then he would come of Abraham. Then he would come not of Ishmael, he would come of Isaac. Not of Esau, but Jacob. Not Reuben or Joseph, he had come from Judah. He had come from Boaz in a city named Bethlehem. Had a guy named David, had a, I'm sorry, named Jesse. Had a kid named David, a kid named Solomon, a kid named Zerubbabel that gave birth to a boy named Joseph that was a fantastic individual. He's the man who would have been king, but he's not king. He's just working as a common laborer. He's a carpenter. Wondering, you know, if they just hadn't have defected, I'd have been living in splendor. But here I am. I'm the son of David. And I'm making tables. But he had a young, beautiful woman he was engaged to named Mary. And one day, there was a voice that spoke from behind her, and she turned. And history would never be the same. And the angel said, it's time. It's time. Aslan is in the land. You will have a son and you will name him Jesus because he will Jesus his people from their sins. He'll save them. And God said to his father, or to his, the man that would oversee his life, Joseph, they'll name him Emmanuel. That means God with us. John said, we beheld his glory as of the only glory of the Father, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They said, what manner of man is this that the wind and the sea obey him? They said, no one spake as this man. He was the ultimate extraterrestrial. He's the ultimate E.T. He touched the dead and the dead lived. He spoke to it and it lived. And all of the increments of death, the deafness to God, the blindness to God, the uh, insensitivity of leprosy, being able to touch, to know a human touch. He restored all of the senses that man could now operate truly in the world that God gave him. Marvelous. What did we do to him? We lied about him, tortured him, then we killed him. Made perfect sense. Because he spoke the truth. Why do you come arrest me as a robber? You heard me teaching in the temple. The only thing I've ever done is to tell you truth. He told us the truth. And we killed him, and we killed him slow. And yet, as God said in Genesis, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Justice was met. The wrath of God was, was propitiated. Sin was atoned for. Satan was disarmed. And man could now judicially be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And he could be radically altered and the history that he touched would never be the same. And we would date history from that moment before Christ to Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Awaiting his return and his reign. And until that time between his cross and his return. It began a period that has been called the history of the church, and we have a mission. we got to do something before he comes. It's a mission that is headed by Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the implementation of humans, the church, to the ends of the earth. And what their job is, is to take the message of Christ, and to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, Peter said. It is to call out through the gospel the elect of God. To where they will, like Peter said, come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. To return to their sovereign and their head and to restore their lives back to them of what God had made them to be. That is the church. 
one of the fellows that was here at the early service was Mike Martin. Mike serves in Korea, one of the largest American army bases in the world. He is with Cadence Ministry, and he does nothing, but he wakes up every day, and he has Bible studies with servicemen and ladies in the service, and he brings to them the knowledge of God. Mike, when I met him, many of his family, most of his immediate family, was in prison. He was taken away from his family and put in the Buckner Boys' home. Uh, to find out who he was, he joined the Marines. Always a good philosophic guy. So join the Marines. And then he got out, and on GI Bill, he went to North Texas. And to figure out who he was, he took psychology. See if that would help him. He was trying to figure out who he was. And one day, we had an outreach meeting at McConnell Hall at North Texas for Campus Crusade. And I was simply talking about Christ that offered peace, pardon, purpose, and power. And I, this was in the mid-70s, and I remember looking over, and there was a fellow sitting in the window. He was just kind of perched in the window. And he's got a blue toboggan on, and he's just looking. And I remember thinking, I hope I don't make that individual mad. <laughs> I used to see him out in front of Kerr Hall. We used to have a guy at college in North Texas named Tom Seaburn. He was the number two guy in the world in Taekwondo competition. And Mike used to spar with him. And they would go out in front of Kerr Hall and just beat each other senseless. And so I look at him and I reviewed my message. All right. Is there anything in here that could be intimidating? And he just sat there and he listened. And he came up and spoke to me. And the next Sunday he was in church. And the next thing he did, he got converted. And then he gave his heart completely to Christ. And then he ended up going to Dallas Seminary. And now he is in mission. He got delivered from the domain of darkness. This was a guy who had dropped out of school when he was about 15, started working as a woodsman, was drinking hard scotch and whiskey as a kid. And God took him and moved him from here to here. And today, we got oodles of guys who trust their kids to this guy. And that's just one of many stories. How many of you remember whenever Bill Gaither did that album called the Hallelujah Album, the Praise Gathering of Believers? Did it back in like 1860. Remember that? It was the first of the praise albums. Luana, you remember it? It was the first of the praise albums. And one of the guys sings on there, I think his name was Doug Oldham, and he sang a song about his own life. And he sang, "'Twas a life filled with aimless desperation." You remember that? "'Without hope walk the shell of a man, "'then a hand with a nail print reached downward, "'just one touch, and a new life began, "'and the old rugged cross made the difference, "'and a life filled with heartache and defeat, "'and I will praise him forever and ever, "'for the cross made the difference for me. That was one of those tunes that made the hymnal because it just struck the heart of every Christian. And that is what our mission is. It's Normandy. It's to go to a place that there is a black cloud on it and Christ went first and he gained a beachhead. And now we come in after him and we spread out and we keep moving on, taking lives and delivering them. The thief came to rob, kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, to have men born again until ultimately we hit Berlin and Christ comes. It's another sermon for another day. Well, are you with me so far? This is our mission. It is redemptive. It is to go snatch humans. It is to go into a quicksand pile, muck. Quicksand, what's a mess of quicksand called? Quicksand mess. <laughs> and you tie something to your ankle and dive head first. And you see if you can get them before they die and pull you out with them. It's, it's a fireman going into that burning building to get that guy. It is a, uh, a lifeguard racing to that surf 
because someone got out in the undertow and it's going to suck them out to Hawaii. We'll find their bodies floating 100 miles out there. Somebody's got to get to them and bring them back. That's the church. We got all kinds of things that go around it. And they're good things that coexist. But this is the mission right here. This is why we're here. As the Father sent me, how's the rest of that go? So send I you. Hebrews says get. Get out there. Get in the midst of them. And get them home. Luke chapter 11. Just stay with me real quick. Jesus was told, as he did miracles, a brilliant conclusion. You are empowered by the devil. Makes perfect sense. That's why I'm delivering guys from the devil. Now, there's an instinct of man to look at the things of God and to say like Pharaoh did of Israel, there's too many of y'all and you're going to do us great evil. That the smartest thing we can do is to get rid of believers. That was the brilliance of Pharaoh. It was the brilliance of Nebuchadnezzar to have his kingdom blessed by Daniel so immediately says you can't pray to God. Politicians are so smart. And he just implodes his own kingdom. Well, they said to Jesus, you're acting in accordance with the devil. You're the worst thing that ever happened to our world is Christianity. Jesus said, no, no. Verse 20, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I'm the king, and I'm here to deliver men. And in verse 21, he says, let me give you the casting here. Let me give you the lay of the land. When a strong man, who's the strong man? Who's the guy who owns the earth that doesn't let anybody out? Who's the tyrant? It is Satan, the strong man. He is fully armed. He has man's mind. He has man's will. He has man's emotion. He has man's culture. He has the arts. He has man's education on the by and large. He's fully armed. And he guards his own house. Question, who's his own house? It's planet Earth. It's Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. He is the God of this world, the prince of the power of this air. And so, it's his. And his possessions, who are his possessions? Men and women. They are undisturbed. Literally, they are at peace. You're not going to educate them, Mr. Jefferson, into redemption. That's been the American gospel. If we'll just educate them, we'll make them smart. They'll know how to vote. They can make money. We'll have a great country. You can't educate them into redemption. You can't get them on... Advocare and Shackley. It may help the little sinner live longer with a better colon. <laughs> but are you going to save him? You can give him better medical care, but that's not going to save him. You can give him better dental care, and that will not save him. You can and add your own right deal in there. You can put him in more comfortable surroundings. You can give him the right to make money and accrue capital, but it's not going to save him. His possessions are undisturbed. I've got them. I've got them from the womb on. They're mine. And then in 22, someone stronger. Question, who's someone stronger? Jesus. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. Christ has come and Satan bows in his presence. And he attacks him. That was his life. When Christ was born, as soon as he was born, Satan wanted him dead. As soon as he became visible and got up and preached in that synagogue in Nazareth, they wanted to throw him off that hill. He wanted him dead. He wanted him tempted. He wanted him dead in the garden when he was sweating blood. He didn't want him on that cross. Christ was Normandy. When he hit that beach... And he took that beach. That's why Hitler had all of his panzers where he thought they might come. He was missing one, but he thought they might come because Hitler knew if they secure 
that tip of southern France, they're going to keep going through Belgium and Holland. And they're going to end up letting France go. And then they're going to end up at my doorstep. And then they're going to have to call in my dentist to identify my burned by cuspids. And they did. <laughs> and so Christ attacked. That's what Christmas is. I remember one Christmas I preached, and as I got up to preach, I put on a hymn. You know what it was? It was Patton's theme. Everybody wondered what I was doing. And I said, this is Christmas. It was Normandy. It was the beachhead. And he secured it. And now an open conduit is given, and we flood in. And in verse 22, he attacks him and he overpowers him. That was the cross. He was beaten. Christ rose from the dead, and thus he is virulent. He is righteous, and whoever he touches is now saved. And within days, you had 4,000 saved guys that escaped Satan right there in Jerusalem. Then you had another 5,000. Then all of a sudden, it spread into Antioch. Then it spread into Galatia. Then it spread into Macedon. And then it spread into Rome, and it spread into Europe. And it spread into China. And it crossed the ocean. And he just kept taking in souls. Often the scripture will say, and there were added that day 5,000 souls. We took them. He overpowers him. Then he takes away all of his armor on which he has relied. He slaps him naked and he hides his clothes. He takes his armor. He's whipped. Now man can now, by virtue of God's grace, see correctly of the truth. He can now have his affections correctly. He can now do his house correctly. He can now live morally correctly. That guy can get restored. He can get transformed by the renewing of his mind. Satan no longer holds him anymore. Man can see him for what he is. And he distributes his plunder. You know what that means? He takes all of the little humans that Satan has kept and he gets them out like Mike Martin that is over right now preaching the gospel in Korea. Satan lost him, and now we got him, and God has got him. That's what the church's mission is. I could go right here to every single one of you, and I could have you stand up and give a testimony about what your life was like in the darkness, in the impetus towards sin, and then somebody came with the message of redemption. And God, like Lydia of old, opened your heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul, and you believed and you got saved. The thief came to rob, not just to rob, but to kill, not just to kill, but to incinerate. He came that you might have life and have it abundantly, and your life changed. Amen? Because somebody that you knew had their head screwed on as to why they were here. That is my mission. I am here to make money to keep my body alive so that, as best I can, I can make relationships with guys and I can wait till they cry, and they will, and I can dry their tears with, I got good news. God has come for you. Well, at the end of the text, however, in 23, he that doesn't gather with me scatters. This is called the mission. Not only am I going to gather, he says, you guys got to gather too. When I was a young guy wondering about what I was going to do with my life, a campus crusader said, make it simple. Don't wonder about what God's will is for your life. Ask what is God's will. God's will is to gather out the elect prior to his judgment. Do that. And how you make your money, it doesn't care. God will take care of that. Just make your money as best you can. Enjoy life as best you can. But that's why he came. That's what God is. He's a carpenter. He redeems stuff. You get with him, and you become the carpenter's son. And you know what? That was the best counsel I was ever given. So I've never struggled with God's will for my life, because I know what God's will is. Now, how I do it, he can take care of that as it goes. But I know what his will is, and that will never change. Let me show you something else. Flip to your right to Ephesians Chapter 5, 
Paul talking to these guys that are literally at the guardian place of the goddess Diana in Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he tells them in verse 15, as they walk in this corrupt, godless world. Y'all remember what the Ephesians did when they got saved? They burned $50,000 worth of witchcraft books. He said in verse 15, therefore be careful how you walk, or literally walk circumspect, circa, around spect, vision. As you walk through life, walk like this. Walk like a point man in Vietnam. Walk like the scout ahead of the cavalry. Walk like Rowdy Yates. Rawhide. Clint Eastwood. Always be walking and looking at what your eyes see, what your body feels. Don't go off that path. Walk circumspect. And in verse 16, don't just look, do something. In 15, walk as wise men, but in 16 it says the days are evil. So do something. My Bible says making the most of your time. Is that what most of you get? Making the most of your time? You know what the Greek says? It says redeeming the time. Now let me tell you what that means. The word to buy is the word agora that means the market. And so the verb agorazo means to buy something. If you put a little prefix X in front of that, it means to buy something, remove it, take it home, make it yours. Redeeming the time is literally what the Greek text says. We have a time between the death of Christ and his return. That's the time. You and I have been given a little increment of that time. 70 years, if by strength, 80. We've been given a time. Redeem it. Get something back. In the context, the days are evil. Change your world. Go in and take men and women that are in evil and move them out. Just last week, a dear couple came to me and we talked and he called the next day and said, my wife and I want to be born again. I said, hallelujah. He came to my Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening study. We spent time together. He said, at my marriage, we're trying to patch up where we've been I gave him some, I gave him Song of Solomon. I said, you just listen to him. Just listen. And we'll get together and we'll start making a little attendant changes on things. You think he's going to get surprised about some changes? And then with child rearing, and then the use of his money, then the use of his language, his relationships, his purpose. God is about to flow through his life like a red dye. And Lord willing, in a few months, and a few years, he's not even going to look the same. So we're going to take him out of where he was, and we're going to bring him of where he should be. That's redeeming the time, making your life count. I called the fellow that shared the gospel with me. His name was Jerry Cook. He died of uh, a brain infection in Van, Texas, about 15 years ago. And I called him before he died. He was the guy that came into my room and shared the gospel with my roommate. And I called him. And I said, Jerry, I just want you to know, I've got two sons. And here's the boys they are. I've got, they're marrying these two girls. This kind of girls they are. This is my wife. This kind of woman she is. And I led my daddy to Christ. And I led my brothers to Christ. And my best friend Joe, I led him to Christ. And I was, I do this, and these are, I ran into this guy, and I've been able to do this, and this is the life that you offered me. And I said, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming in my room. Thank you for praying for our dorm. And thank you for sharing the gospel with me. Because I escaped from the strong man's house. 
because of you. By God's grace, he used you. And I'll never forget you. And he said to me, look for me at the eastern gate. I said, I'll find you. I'll find you. Then he died. That's redeeming the time. Let's celebrate communion. Heavenly Father, for just a few minutes, we pause and we remember. And if there is any sin in our life, we will confess it. And we will go back to where we started. As Israel would go back to the Passover lamb, that we will go back to where we started. And we'll remember you. We'll remember your goodness. We'll remember your grace. We'll remember the death of your son. We'll remember the horror of crying forsaken. That we will say, I will be in the house of the Lord forever. We will be unforsaken. Thank you for what you do. And thank you, Lord, that as we grow old, that you are ever the same. You carried us as children and you shall carry us till our dying day. We bless your name. And we pray, Lord, for this church as we seek to learn and to walk circumspectly and then to go into this world, into the marketplace, guide our steps. We'll remember now.